Evening and welcome to tonight's uh, Q&A session, the Ask of Pharma Q&A session. My name is Bridget Barry and I coordinate Farming for Nature. This Q&A was set up in order to hear from our exemplary farmers, our ambassadors, that um, each year we find through our uh, ambassador awards. And this Q&A session is a great way to hear from our ambassadors, find out what practical actions they're doing on their land for nature, but also for you guys to ask any questions that you might have of the, of the ambassador about their practices for nature on their farm. So if you have any questions over the next hour, uh, just pop them into the chat box and I'll facilitate them as we go along. Um, but I'll kickstart the event with a few questions with our guest speaker tonight. So tonight we have um, Blotna Gallagher from County Galway joining us. Blotna's a sheep farmer with her uh, husband, Niall. And um, Blotna, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight, straight from the farm, as we can see. Yes, thank you, Bridget. Thank you, everybody who's come along to join the Ask the Farmer for Farming for Nature tonight. It's a great uh, privilege to be here. Brilliant. Blahin, thanks. Um, so, as mentioned, you have a sheep farm in County Galway. Can you just describe your own journey onto this farm? Um, well, my background really is I was born and reared in a city, but my parents both came from farms. And this is the mother that my this is the farm that my mum came from. So it was left to me uh, about seven years ago and I had about five years of pure and utter restoration to do on the farm because sadly my uncle had hoarders and for anybody that are familiar with that condition it means that they can't pass by a skip or a bin or a single thing without holding on to stuff. So we held on to a lot of stuff for all the neighbours in the parish and you know everybody just brought stuff to Uncle PJ because you know, he might need it for something. And uh, so Niall and I had a lot of work to do just to try and get back to the basics. And we were very fortunate because Uncle PJ had farmed this farm, which is it's over 100 acres. It's based in East Galway near the very historic village of Ockram. And he had always had an extensive attitude towards farming and he never really left the 40s or the 50s. Um, and if he had his way, he'd still be working with the horse and he'd be still pulling a, a plough by horse. Uh, mechanisation and intensive farming was not something that he was comfortable with. And I suppose that was a great thing for Niall and I when we took over the farm, because once we got rid of all the unwanted rubbish, we had beautiful multi-sword um, sword grass lands. And then we were fortunate enough to join the National Parks and Wildlife Scheme to discover that we had an abundance of the Devil's Bit Sebaceous, and there was a lot of reasons why farming for nature here on this farm was just a natural progression from what my antecedents had done right through to where we are today. But we need a little bit of help, Bridget. And I spoke to a neighbour of mine and I said to him, what am I going to do about all the weeds? Because there was a lot of weeds. There was a lot of mismanagement of the grassland over a period of about 20 years. And he said, well, the first thing you need to do now, he said, is get yourself some sheep. I said, right, OK, I think I can manage that. I had a cultural experience in the 80s. I'd been a student in the brilliant Mount Bellew Agricultural College and I had done three years there. And um, I had also gone back to uh, NUIG in 2019 and done my master's in agricultural innovation. So I was coming with experience and uh, plenty of ideas. Um, so I got in the sheep and they were terrific. So without the need to add pesticides or to do any uh, spraying whatsoever on the land they slowly got to work on the docks and the nettles and the trestles and what I do is I combine that with topping and I top in various different um, parts of the land and for non-farmers non that might be here in the group topping is basically like cutting the grass except for you're not harvesting it as silage or hay so what I do is when the when the weeds get to a particular level I go out with my giant size lawnmower and, and I top certain areas and I leave other areas there for the pollinators so that it doesn't all disappear at once because whilst we want to farm with nature and, you know, a lot of the trissels and nettles are wonderful pollinators, they're also recognised as noxious weeds here in Ireland. So it's illegal to allow them go um, completely wild on your farm. So what I do is I farm with the Galway sheep and they're a dual purpose breed. And that's very much part of our sustainability ethos and carbon footprint here on the farm. So not only were we producing them for meat, we're also producing them for their for their beautiful heritage Irish wool, which would be traditionally known to an awful lot of people as Bonine. And it was also the iconic wool that the women of Ireland would have used because back then these lowland sheep breed were all you could find in Ireland. It was before we introduced the mountainies and the meat producing breeds. The farmers had fallen in love with this lowland sheep, which subsequently became known as the Galway. And these sheep would produce both lamb, mutton and wool. 
for the farmer. So it was a wonderful enterprise back then. And it's fantastic ex- enterprise for me right now. Great, thanks. And I mean, we can't ignore that you have a few ladies around us. Do you want to introduce us to them? What's your farm look like at the moment? What's going on at the moment on your farm? Well, it's waiting time. Uh, so we're all waiting. The girls, there's 25 pedigree Galways that are fully registered with the Galway Sheep Breeders Association. Um, so part of what I do is that I that I work as closely as possible uh, to the association. And that then lends to provenance in the product that I'm selling, whether it be the lamb as heritage Irish lamb or whether it be the wool. So just to tell you a little bit about the breed. So, as I said, they're the native breed to Ireland and the state recognise them. The state actually only recognises the Galway as a native breed. And I think that's a lot to do with the 100 years of provenance that the sheep breeders have put into um, registering the sheep and recording the, the, the pedigree of them. So they're very large. So if anybody can see them, they actually look, my husband sometimes looks out and he says, are the seals all asleep? Because they look like big, big seals. The females will grow up to 80, 85 kilos and the men, the rams will go over 100 kilos. So they're what they call a slow grow or they don't really come into their own until the second year. And that wasn't unusual in the past when farmers were using them as a part of their grazing management system. They would have very naturally kept livestock all winter long because you can keep these girls outdoors. They're only in tonight um, for the bit of fame. That's all. And just, uh, you know, to brighten up the, the, the questions and answers for the people that have come along to join us tonight. So they're very large. And then they have this abundance of snowy white wool. So I see with this girl. No, there's one here. She's very friendly. Um, so their wool, they'll grow up to five kilos of wool. So that's a lot of wool for any sheep to produce. And that's why traditionally they were loved and their wool was so good for carpets and blankets and upholstery. And it even went into textiles back then because the women who were crafting would have naturally left the lanolin in it. So it didn't matter about the micron. The luster was there because the lanolin kept the wool not only soft, but, but waterproof as well. So that five kilos of wool will sequest up to 10 kilos of carbon. And that's a lot of carbon for that I'm very proud of. I'm sequ- I'm sequesting here on the farm. The sheep themselves will bring you anything from a single, a double or a triplet. And we have a little girl over here behind us. She's not she's camera shy tonight. I didn't want her to come into the small group because she's heavily pregnant with triplets. They're extremely docile. And farming with nature for me needs to be about a particular pace of life. Because if you're farming with nature, you have to just be able to slow down one of the few times that I do slow down but you know you have to be very observant you have to watch the weather you have to watch the seasons you have to watch the grass growth the tree growth and then you have to watch where your flowers and your pollinators are at so working with a docile breed like this means that there's no sheep running here there or everywhere or breaking ditches or you know they just you walk out to the fields they look up at you and they're like right what are we at now today? So that brings a whole sense of calm about farming with nature here at Murray Meadows. Right. And you don't use a sheepdog then, is it? Or... No, I am. Her... I am the sheepdog, Bridget. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, no, to know you. And they're easily trained. So I open a particular gate. They come through that gate. Um, they just know. They just, they're very slow creatures. I did akin them to beach, large beach whales or beach, beach shields. They're very blubberish. Their meat, um, whilst we didn't taste any this year because all our livestock went for breeding purposes, there's been such a huge interest in and re- a renewed interest in the breed. Um, their meat is quite succulent. Um, so if you're looking at it from a meat production um, perspective um, as a farmer, you're bringing a docile native breed that can sequester a lot of carbon onto your farm, but you'll also produce an extremely succulent uh, piece of meat and we hear a lot of farmers these days talking about the pace of putting you know everybody wants to put meat on their animals really quickly but nobody talks about the taste and I think we'll all agree it's the taste of the meat it's the texture of the meat that really draws you back time and time again to particular cuts or particular sources whether they be butchers or what all that you go to get your your meat so this meat is well marbled so it's almost akin to the wagyu of beef it's an extremely extremely succulent meat and it's slow grown and it's grown with nature. So we're quite proud of that. Excellent. And can you take me through, for those of us who don't know, say the lifespan of the wool. So once you shear your sheep, what happens next? Um, 
Well, there's two processes. There's the, there's, there's the more recent uh, pre the co-op process, which was that you show your sheep, you were really proud, you had your uh, 10 kilos per animal and you put it into bags, you made sure it was dag free, you brought it to the local depot and the depot manager looked at you and said, what do you expect me to do with that? You do realise there's no market for Irish wool. And then you just gave it to him and then he would ship it down. Then he would it would be picked up then by a merchant, of which there are probably a handful left in the country. And then that merchant will be at the behest of the international trade markets in Bradford. And there in Bradford, it would join the British wool clip and it will become part of a national clip of now a clip, by the way, just for a little bit of housekeeping. A clip is what we refer to to a large gathering of fleeces. So when you when you shear the sheep, you have what's called wool in the grease, which means that it's wool with its lanolin intact. And that wool in the grease, when you have a lot of it, is called a clip. Um, so that clip with the Irish clip then is it literally channeled from the sheep farmer to the depot, the depot to the merchant. The merchant then brings it to the massive auction houses that exist in Bradford. And there um, it's it's channeled out into the Asian carpet markets. But sadly, when it leaves this country and I'd like, you know, a couple of key points to take home tonight. When it's leaving this country, it's actually leaving it as category three waste material. And it's been that way since the foot and mouth disease. And it's 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 kind of sad, really, because it, it affords the Asian carpet markets the right to say, well, listen, we're buying your waste. And we all know, or if we don't know by now, wool is one of the most amazing biofibers on the planet. So you can do everything with wool from construction, craft. Um, you can you can build a house with it. You can build bridges with it. Anywhere where you would traditionally see polyfibers, um, in place, you can have biofiber and wool is one of the strongest and especially Irish wool is one of the strongest biofibers out there. So what we've done with the Galway, because she's such a rare species, is we created a wool co-op, which means that we take this wool out from that traditional channel that I've just explained. And it's almost like a kind of a protest. We're saying our wool is better than that. Our wool is heritage wool. It's part of our agricultural heritage. And most importantly, it was the biofibre on which our Irish woollen industry was founded. So we believe that it deserves a lot more credit than being cast aside as category three waste material. And we set up the co-op and we harvested to one central location in what we call the Galway Wool Harvest, or it's known as the Galway Wool Mehel. And a mehel, for your listeners who are not familiar with the Irish word, means it's it's a description of an event that takes place where people barter their time and their energy for free. So what you do is you'd come to somebody else's house and it might be a mehel and you'd harvest grain or you'd, you know, you might be involved in shearing the sheep or you might be involved in a sheep dipping process, but you were essentially helping your neighbour and your neighbour was helping you. And sometimes all you'd get out of it, baby, would be a meal. But it was the gesture, it was the sense of community that really counted. So we refer to our wool harvest as a mehel. And at the Mehel every year, we can harvest up to 5,000 kilos. And it's my job to spend 12 months of the year looking for a buyer for that 5,000 kilo. Now, we were, have been very fortunate in that Donegal Yarns in the northwest of the country for the first and second year um, came along and they supported the Mehel. And we love all of the mills in Ireland and all of the knitting wear, knitwear and blanket manufacturers in Ireland to support the Mehel because... Before the co-op, I was told part of the reason why there was a, a void of Irish grown wool in, in, in our Irish woolen industry was that there was no supply chain. And now we don't have just one supply chain in what the co-op are doing. We also have a wonderful project based in County Wicklow called Eru. And there's a lovely couple up there who are actually harvesting next to skin type wool from various different breeds around the whole country. So they've actually, you know, they've thrown like... They've spoiled that whole idea that the, that the manufacturers can't use Irish wool because it's too strong, because what they're doing is they're producing beautiful baby blankets and they're producing beautiful knitwear from wool that's quite soft and that can be worn next to skin. And, you know, it's up. To, it, there are lots of things that you can do. You can add to the actual wool. You can you can change the method so you can have a woolen spun yarn. You can have a worsted spun yarn, which is perfect. Um, for Irish grown wools. And then you can also play around with wool after it's been spun. Um, and there are various different ways that it can be softened. And there are probably loads of different ways that it can be softened that we don't even know about. 
So there's great hope and there's great opportunity as long as we can just clearly differentiate the difference between Irish wool, which comes from Australia and is spun here in Ireland and then goes into our goods and wool that actually grows in Ireland that's been exported as a category three um, waste material. So so there's a lot of education, uh, Bridget, and I hope that tonight will create a lot of interest among the Farming for Nature followers and that they themselves will become part of this army of people who are now trying to get the truth out there about this wonderful biofibre that we grow and don't seem to have created. Um, you know, we we need to bring it back into our supply chain. If we don't, the farmers are just going to possibly get out of sheep breeding, which would be disastrous for biodiversity within the island. Or they may opt for these new breeds coming in that don't have wool at all at all, which flies in the complete face of nature because wool is hair. That's actually what it is. It's actually Afro hair. It's really, really curly hair. And these girls, woo, these girls have really long, fibrous hair. It's quite curly. Um, and what's very unique about it is its color. The entire sheep is white. Um, and that's why the wool is called bonine, which is the Irish word for lovely white or little white. Amazing. God, there's lots there. And you've achieved so much in such a short time, Blotton. So well done. Um, I didn't realize until speaking to you that the Irish woolen industry uh, is uh, is not necessarily Irish grown woolen industry. So that was a, a misnomer, isn't it? Um, so for you, uh, you've set up the wool co-op, the Galway wool co-op, and you're now selling, trying to find markets for that and stuff. What's do you feel that there's um, a great future for this co-op and what's your plans for it? I think the, the the Farming for Nature program that I'm on will hopefully encourage me to encourage other farmers to look at dual purpose breeds or to look at breeds that have potential with their wool because sadly a lot of farmers are really rightly peed off and they should be. I mean, getting 20 cent a kilo for a, a natural biofiber that grows every year and sequests carbon is an absolute disgrace. But if you're producing an animal that's predominantly being bred for her meat or its meat, and if you're being encouraged to produce lamb efficiently, quickly, and as plentifully as possible, without any part of that education being about wool uh, or breeds that produce good quality wool, well, then that flies in the face of why the situation has occurred. So, you know, when I left ag college 30 years ago, nobody taught, taught me about wool or wool production. And then you look at what we're doing down in New Zealand, where they have a very similar system to ours. And it's crucial. You don't do any breeding. or You wouldn't consider having any sheep on your farm unless you were selecting breeds that would have a good wool quality, whether it be for carpets or textile. So I would like to think that in the future, we would encourage farmers to really, if they want to start, you know, getting a revenue stream for their wool, that they consider that type of breeding and maybe revert to dual purpose breeds like the Galway or the Romney. Um, there's Cheviot, there's Border, uh, Border Leicester. Like there's loads of breeds out there. I'm, you know, I've got a conscientious bias towards my own native breed. Why wouldn't I? I'm very proudly an Irish person. But I just think that there's so much scope there for, for working with dual purpose breeding. And I think hopefully the Galway will co-op and the partnership that we have uh, with Donegal Yarns will continue to encourage farmers to breed more of this native. I mean, remember, Bridget, she was on the European endangered animal list at one point in time. So like at one point in time, the EU was screaming at the Irish government saying, you know, you're going to lose one of your native species if you don't do something about it. And they did a lot of work in fairness to the department with the Galway Sheep Breeders Association in the 80s to actually stop this extinction from occurring. So, you know, you have a very, very efficient uh, animal, great natural weed controller, breeds beautiful sheep, lambs on her own, sits in a shed when she has to, smiles when she has to, produces lamb and wool. So I think it would have been a shame if it wasn't for the Galway sheep breeders. I think it would have been a shame if we had lost this beautiful part of our, our agricultural heritage. You're a great promoter of them. And, you know, it's great that there was intervention in the 80s. What do you think the government could do now to support... Uh, the Galway wool uh, and the Irish woolen industry? I think um, the Irish woolen industry is doing quite well. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they're probably worth about 85 million euros to the exchequer. So the Irish woolen industry, which is made up of the mills and the knitwear manufacturer, who employ a lot of people, by the way. So 
You know, people think that that I'm out there to try and close mills and close manufacturers. It's the opposite. What we want to do is work with the mills, work with the manufacturers and, you know, show them that if you're manufacturing carpet or whether you're manufacturing upholstery, that this wool is ideal and it's available. It's actually available here in Ireland. The supply chain has been restored and it's there and it's available and it's at a very affordable price and it supports biodiversity in rural Ireland. It supports rural economies and it encourages people to to keep, um, you know, different types of species. My biggest fear is that we are going very steadily down the line towards a mono breed or a mono um, enterprise type farming system here in Ireland. And personally, I don't think it suits our ecology and it doesn't suit biodiversity in our landscapes. And what's happening is you've got a large cohort who are, who are kind of pushing towards very intensive farming, high productivity, high outputs. And then it's the rest of us that kind of have to pick up the, the, the you know, the, the fluffy bits, the nature bits, the, you know, the little bit of schemes here, wherever you can. And, and, and that's a dangerous place. That's a very dangerous place when the agricultural narrative is being led by one particular cohort of farmers um, without the others getting a sort of a look in or a speak in. I think it's not just creating an imbalance at the at, at policy level, but it could be disastrous for our biodiversity if we don't, you know, wake up to the fact that multi enterprises um, traditionally worked in tandem with nature here on the island, and multi enterprises at the farm level, you know, that they they are they're good. They're, 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 they've they've proven in the past to be quite efficient. So I think it could be quite detrimental if we lose sheep farming in Ireland. And what I'd like the woolen industry to realise is they've done quite well. They've done very well out of the perception that the wool is Irish. So maybe give a little bit back, uh, maybe continue to employ the brilliant people that you do, continue to be um, as good uh, ambassadors as we need for our designers internationally, but be more mindful about the resources that are available on the island. And, you know, is it the state's job to intervene? Well, Policy could help, Bridget. I think it would be important if there was policy that said, you know, from here on in, the country of origin of all products, whether they be food or uh, textile, must be indicated. Uh, because the amount of merino that we import and label as Irish or market as Irish is staggering. And there's a there's this very strong addiction there to probably one of the best biofibers in the world, and rightly so. But we have to rattle that supply chain a little bit in order so that that higher dependency and this intensive um, production of merino that's starting to occur could tarnish the international woolen industry if we don't start looking at other breeds, we don't start looking at a commercial level, if we don't start making it commercially right to look at innovation around other types of wool, well, then we could be looking at a major bio disaster within the international wool industry. And it's not just my opinion, it's been widely predicted that our, our addiction and dependence on merino um, for everything, or upholstery, everything. Synthetics was a problem. Um, I think we're starting to sway a lot more towards natural fibres, which is wonderful because it's a natural resource. This wool grows from Irish soil. So this, all this needs is soil, grass, water, and sunlight. And we have this beautiful biofibre. And, you know, we're filling our homes with petrochemically based insulation. And we're trying to run our cars on electricity but yet we haven't on this island yet set up a manufacturer of wool-based insulation products, wool-based bedding. Uh, we've only got one processor in Ireland here that's actively gone out to try and make sure that the wool is coming from Irish farmers, Irish sheep. So there's a lot of ambiguity and there's a lot of, you know, we need to tighten our act. I, I, I kinned today to somebody I was speaking from. Can you imagine a French vineyard selling wine that was made from the finest South African grapes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden people discovered that they weren't French grapes. I think there would be a lot of disappointment there. And if the vineyard said, well, I couldn't get French grapes, I think people would say, well, why didn't you look hard enough? And if the vineyard said, well, well the French grapes wouldn't be good enough for my wine, I think there would still be disappointment. And I think the consumer would say, well, go find good Irish wool, go find next to skin Irish wool, because it's out there. Eru and Wicklow have proven that it's out there. Uh, the farmers in Ireland have proved that that presenting good wool, clean wool, inspecting it, being proud of it, that can be done. So, so I think there's great hope. And I think working with industry, acknowledging the good that the industry has done, 
um, is the great is a great partnership that I'm really looking forward to being part of. And I think bringing the farmers along is 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 just a wonderful way of 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 supporting bio biodiversity on on farms throughout Ireland. And because you mention it, I mean, do you feel by choosing a native Irish breed, you do have different or better biodiversity on your land? Is do you have a kind of any examples better. on your land of, of how it's? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because they're on grass all year round. I don't bring them in. They're only in tonight for the um. They're only in tonight for the fun. Uh, so they're out all year long. I mean, if we had a particular night and there was a good few of them dropping, I'd bring them in. I'd keep them in with their lambs, maximum 24 hours. So their immunity is quite good. So I'm in an organic farm system here as well. So like my docent is down to a minimum. These are all yos. So they weren't dosed for 12 months. The lambs might need a small dose depending on the fecal egg sample that I will do. So without sounding too technical, you literally get a plastic bag. You pick up the poo, you send it off to your vet. He puts it under the microscope and he tells you whether or not you've got a worming problem. So the amount of ivermectins that can go out there and cause damage within the soil. We had uh, Bruce last week telling us about the beetles. Well, Bruce, you know, knows that ivermectin can be detrimental to uh, to soil life. So we've almost eliminated the use of ivermectin because they're so happy in a natural environment. This is this is where they're happy. This is where they're happiest. So they they work they work on a grass system, um, and it's got low inputs for me. And I, as I said, the fact that I don't have a dog running around means that the rest of the, the wildlife on the farm, and we do have a lot of wildlife on the far, farm. By the way, we have a lovely habitat. Um, we have thirteen acres that have been set aside for uh, one of Ireland's very rare um, species of butterfly called the marsh fritillary. She's uh, almost well. She has been on the endangered European endangered list quite a few times. So we're doing a lot of work with national parks to, to bring back the butterfly um, into a particular area. And because it's so untouched and unmanaged, it's also encouraging an awful lot of other ecology back into the area. So we see a lot. We see foxes, we see hare. Uh, we haven't seen the badger, we haven't seen the stoat, but you see a lot of you see a lot of signs of them, especially the poo and the little the little avenues that they have gone up and down to the water and things like that. So so it's, you know, it's a lovely place to work. It's great. Anybody that gets an opportunity to go back to nature or visit a friend's farm or visit a relative's farm, get out there, do it. You'll be astounded what you learn and you'll be astounded the type of lovely uh, animals that you meet. Brilliant. We're actually, um, I've got a few questions coming in. So I just asked my last question before um, we, we kickstart the questions. Can you tell me some of the challenges you've had along the way, perhaps with your just your own farming system? Because, you know, you're kind of you've taken it on recently. You seem to have done a huge amount setting up the wool car up as well as getting to know your ladies and stuff. Have you yeah, had any challenges? The, um... Oh, Jesus, I hope, um, sorry about the language. Um, I, I, I don't really, uh, Bridget, I've, I've, I've loved every minute. I mean, getting rid of scrap cars and getting screwed up the old oil containers i mean there was there was, there was a lot of time spent doing what i would consider janitorial work and i'd be listening to friends going oh you got off the farm today and i'm going if only they knew what i was at farming isn't always as glamorous as people make it out to be you know so so i really only got to immerse myself in the nature and the animal husbandry side of things in the last two years so i suppose that was a mammoth task um i didn't get an opportunity to get involved in some of the environmental schemes that were going so I was funding and I still am funding a lot of um, projects on the farm myself. The farm is starting to wipe its face, which is great. I'm thrilled with that. But we also have social farming here. And I think that's been um, probably akin to one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And it's where we afford an opportunity for people who are coming from maybe a background of poor mental health or poor physical health, or they may have come from institutional care and they get to use, now it's not a pet farm, it's, it's it's where they come to the farm and they explore the nature, they explore, they work with the animals. We keep native ponies, we have donkeys, so they have a chance to work with the donkeys and meet the ponies, Connemaras. And uh, it's just a really lovely day that's spent with them. So so I keep that going as an enterprise as well. Um, so between national parks, the social farm and the wool, yeah, they kept going the whole time. No, there was no major challenges. I think the challenge that is, taken most of my energy over the last three years is the education process around the difference between the Irish woolen industry and the crisis which exists in the Irish wool industry which is the sheep farmers and merchant side of things and you know seeing the shock on people's face no more than your own the other day when you say no sorry that's actually Australian wool imported here 
um, you know, trying to have to explain that narrative whilst working along with manufacturers and mills who are tentatively our customers, it's a difficult space to be. You're trying to, you're trying to, you know, explain things to people as honestly as possible and explain well why our breed is particularly uh, beneficial within the home. And, and at the same time, not upset anybody. And it's it's very easy for people to pick up the idea that I'm trying to, you know, slam the Irish woolen industry. Not at all. Without the Irish woolen industry, as I said earlier, we wouldn't have the wonderful employers that we have the length and breadth of the country. I just want them to maybe like the organic food system 40 years ago. Just give us a little crunch, a little lick of the apple um, and let people decide themselves whether or not they want to have Irish grown wool or, or Irish spun wool in, in their homes and in their in their fabric, you know? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very valid point. Um, so just going on to some questions here, uh, Claire has asked, um, do you use any non-pharmaceutical medicines or even sheep deep or wool treatments? Uh, no, we don't use, as I said earlier on, we're organic. So we only use, we only use medication when the welfare of the animal is, par is paramount. So people have a conception that when you're in organics, you let the animals die because you won't use medication. But what we do is we, we rely on the vet to indicate to us whether or not the animal needs the medication. So we wouldn't be going out blanket dosing all the sheep or we wouldn't be going out. We don't dip the sheep. We haven't dipped the sheep here on this farm for many years, but we do use vetricin, um, which is an ectoparasite. And the reason why we use that is if we don't put an ectoparasite on the fleece of the sheep, they will be attacked by what's called a blowfly. And it's also the primary reason why it's, it's illegal in this country not to shear sheep is because their fleece is the most beautiful place in the world for flies to come and lay their eggs. And why wouldn't she? I mean, it's a big bouncy fleece and it's a lovely protective area. She comes along, she hatches out her eggs, she's trilled it herself. She's just left about three or 400 eggs on the sheep's back. And the next thing, those eggs hatch out into what are known as larvae. The larvae have a mouthpiece and that mouthpiece lives off flesh and the grease and the wool. And if left unattended for as little as 12 hours, that larvae will have created a hole maybe that size. When you come back the next day, the hole is that size. And when you come back the next day, the sheep is dead. Because not only will the larvae eat the sheep alive, but, but they release a toxin from their, from their biting mouth. And that toxin actually poisons the sheep. So it's not just important. It's crucial that all sheep are treated for blowfly at some point during the summer period. Um, so yes, there is a, there is a chemical on the wool, um, but it's not what we would have commonly known as an organic phosphate. So the organic phosphates, which are highly poisonous and carcinogenic, that would have been in sheep dip, we don't use them and we don't encourage them whatsoever. Okay, perfect. And now if Alan's asked, is there a problem with the general culture in Ireland where the majority don't understand good food and products such as lamb, wool and beef? Correct. Well done, Niall. Um, yeah. Um, and the situation with, with with wool is I find it even more difficult, Niall, that people snigger, laugh and get giddy when I mention the wool. Or if I go back to my hometown of Galway, they say, oh, Jesus, how's the wool lady? You know, there's a little bit of this condescending notion that wool is for, you know, they don't see it as a biofiber. They don't see it as a as they don't see it with the huge potential that it has, as I said, not just in our carpets and upholstery and not just in our stately homes, natural carpets and upholstery, but in every fibre of our being, in every fibre of, in every part of construction, uh, there's no reason why we can't, as I said earlier, even set up our own insulation manufacturing plant here with wool on the island of Ireland. Mattresses, pillows, duvets. Like, there's just so much you can do with it. But here in Ireland, we just don't seem to have, I, I, I use this word and I use it lightly, it doesn't seem to be cool enough. You know, it doesn't seem to be, it's not... You know, it's not the sheep farmer generally doesn't have the biggest tractor in, in, in the yard, you know, and I think there's a lot of this big tractor syndrome going on in Ireland at the moment. You do, you know, when I go through the countryside, sometimes I wonder where are the thousands and thousands of acres of tillage in the local area? Because there's machines <laughs> being driven around here. And I'm telling you that most people, so much diesel in them, you'd, you'd, you'd expect them to be cutting hundreds of thousands of, of acres of corn. But um, yeah, there's, there's, you know, you just need to, you just need to swallow your ego and just follow your heart and follow your instinct, and go with what go with quality food, quality wool, and quality products off the farm. Thanks, Niall. Yeah, and he was saying that, uh, you know, people have responsibility to educate each other in the next generation. So, kind of like you were saying there. Um, does Blotnam put any inputs into the grass system? 
Ed, has she ever needed to do seeding of the swords? Uh, Claire has asked. No, aren't I so lucky? How privileged I am. We have farmer's gold here on the farm. In actual fact, I have to take the ponies off the land during the summer because we have an abundance of clover. So it's never been sprayed. PJ never believed in spraying. Um, and I did put a bit of lime out. I did a, a pH test on the lime about uh, three years ago. Uh, before you could actually get paid to put lime out, I actually put it out because I just felt that the pH balance was a little bit low and I wanted to bring it to a place where I knew that it was going to bring uh, a restored health to the soil condition. So soil conditioning for me is very important. And knowing when to take the sheep out or the ponies out of fields, let them rest, let them rejuvenate, uh, knowing when to top the fields, and also being mindful that every time they poo or pee, that's fertilizer going back into the field. So people say to me, oh, do you not spread slurry? And I'm kind of going, well, you know, they're out all year. So the slurry is going in. The slurry is going in the, the nitrates that are needed and the phosphorus, phosphorus and, and all of the good stuff that's coming from their poo. Um, and their urine is actually helping to uh, to increase soil fertility. So watching and working the fields for me it's a process it's almost akin to regenerative farming where if a lamb or just becoming under a little bit of stress move them move them to the next la next field you know and keep moving things around and don't be afraid oh another thing that i love um bridget is the fact that pj also planted a lot of shelter belts on the farm so i planted about uh 13 hectares of forestry and 10 percent of that are native species but he had originally or had originally planted little groves, forest groves. So the sheep and the ponies all have shelter all year long in every single field that you go into. There's somewhere where, can, where they can actually go and huddle from the wind or the rain. And I think that's very important as well when, you, when you've made a decision to outwent your livestock that you have adequate shelter for them. Mm, interesting. Uh, Claire always, uh, also asks, are there any ponds or aquatic habitats on your farm? There are, there's plenty of them. So we have loads of streams. And we have uh, the we have a small little river called the Kilcrow River. Now my husband calls it a brook. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the states, but it's I mean it's only about four foot wide. Uh, but it's it's recognised as a as river on the Ordnance Survey maps. And this year we got involved with um with yourselves with Farming for Nature, and we we opened a pond alongside the river, um with a view to every time that the river swells, it will overflow into the pond, and then that pond ideally will start to what we're hoping that it will bring back some herons into the area. Um, we have seen otter tracks, so we know there's otters coming to and from the waterways. And I don't know if you can hear the rain pelting down on top of the the, um, the shed here. So at the moment where we have, um, we have certain, I call them our little come and go come and go lakes, but we keep geese, we keep a flock of geese and they love the fact that some of the fields fill with water at this time of the year and they're actually able to potter about in the field. So so there's natural water courses. There's the one that we made this year. And then we have um, some of the bog area is actually quite moist at this time of the year as well. So thanks for that question. And uh, she's asked also, are you involved in Tull of Bio or any other farming groups aside from Tull farming? Bio, yes. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I'm only up the road here to one of the founders of Tull of Bio. So, so I've been Excuse me, I've been to some of their meetings, um, but between the co-op, the Breeders Association, uh, the work that I'm doing at the moment to set up a heritage Irish lamb group, um, the work on the farm, the social farming, I just don't seem to find the time to get involved as much as I would love to with Hall of Bio. So maybe when the next generation come along and they, they show me and guide me where the co-op needs to go, um, at that point, I might get more involved in the associations that I think are the backbone of, of Irish agriculture. Great. Um, Sean Kelly has asked, what do you think about agroforestry and rewilding in the uplands? I know the uplands isn't where you are, but... Um... No, I mean, I'm in, uh, I'm just outside, Sean, is it? I'm just outside Banislow. So in, in some ways, I'm probably on the edges of the lowland barren area. You know, I think that's very much up to the individual landowner because as a nation, we can have beliefs on what should and shouldn't be done. And I often find it fascinating that we can go out and buy cheap food and we can go out and demand that food be a particular price. And I'm I'm guilty to, of it myself. I love a good bargain. Don't get me wrong. I don't shop in the finest of, 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 of fine food emporiums, etc. But, you know, the rewilding, we have a bit of rewilding going on here, but we didn't set about to do it. It just happened naturally. And I think if you're going to enforce things like, you know, rewilding on the uplands you have to consider the person that was there farming beforehand and you have to work with them it's like those greenways you work with the farmers 
and let the idea and let the initiative be their own, well, then I would be in favour of it. But I wouldn't be very much in favour of enforcing somebody else's need for doing the right thing over somebody else's need to earn a living or do something the way they've done long term. So if it's done in the right way, Sean, I think it's not a bad idea. But I just think sometimes that we can reach for the low hanging food and somebody somewhere does a bit of research out in Europe and discovers that rewilding is the new way of making everything good again. And then they forget that we're still buying carrots at 39 cent a packet. And we buy lots of carrots at 39 cent a packet. So, so I think there's a bit of balance needed there. I think we need to understand that the people that work those hills are food producers. Um, all farmers are food producers. And we need to be recognized, even though we're that low level on the food chain, we're actually the we're the manufacturer. Again, we're down at the end of that, that, that pyramid. But without farmers and without farming and people like myself who farm for nature, we don't have food. And we need to be mindful of that. And if we want to change food productions, we need to be prepared, be prepared to pay for that. And I think there's a nice balance. If we could find that nice balance between education, proper payment for food, and uh, restoring nat natural nature um, habitats. I think that would be great if we could mix all that up together. Great. From Paris asked, I love the idea of your wool metal. Do you ever hear of farming metals in your area? Do you hear of many farming metals in your area? Yeah, we have um, we have the, uh, the, the traction metal from time to time. I have a farmer here up the road from me, Tony Darmody, and he has an old traction machine. Sorry, now I'm leaning, I'm leaning because the rain is tipping down off the roof here. But um, so Tony has a, a trashing mill where farmers would have come together and they would have trashed the corn. And uh, oh, yeah, plenty of soup and plenty of sandwiches and plenty of biscuits. And sure, there might be a bottle of, Bud bottle of Budweiser as well. Um, so there's always an exchange of work for food. Um, and my uncle was great for it. He used to turn up when he even wasn't wanted because as far as he was concerned, I actually want to get the dinner out of it anyway. You know, so he'd turn up when he's been for where it wasn't needed, you know, because he's a bachelor farmer on his own. So, yeah, the metal is nice. It's, it's nice if it works. I've noticed the last few years, lots of people are coming up with ideas. And oh, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And I'm going, well, if you think it's such a great idea, why don't you do it? So I always say, if you come to the metal and you see me with a clipboard, run, because I'll find a job for you, you know. It's all about leaning in and digging in and helping each other out, really, isn't it? Brilliant. Margaret Brennan has said um, there's, uh, she agrees with you, there's lots of opportunities around the use of wool for house insulation, that they used it in their house in 2006 and it's done a fabulous job. Can't understand why this hasn't taken off as an industry. Um, Patrick Can Doran has said, oh yeah. Sorry, but I'm just going in there to Margaret and say, yes, Margaret, it is a wonderful insulation. And if I do Europe, the amount of people that come up and tell me, do you know you can insulate your house with wool? The issue around it is, is, Nobody in Ireland has found it commercially viable yet. And this is this is the eureka moment, Bridget. We kind of covered it later. Nobody's making money out of wool here just yet. Now, they're starting to do it down in New Zealand because they're spending an awful lot more idea on the, on the concept of commercialising wool. But until somebody starts to make, until one of the knitwear manufacturers starts to get really good money for Irish-grown wool jumpers or... You know, if an insulation company and we have the largest one in Europe based here on the island of Ireland, if they can make money out of Irish grown wool, well, then we'll be able to produce it and scale up. Because right now um, we have an Austrian company selling sheep's wool insulation here in Ireland and it's expensive. And because it's expensive, it's difficult for the common everyday person to do it. But if it was to scale up, I mean, if the state was to say, OK, right, we'll buy three million kilos of sheep's wool insulation made from wool grown in Ireland. And we'll ensure that all the retrofitted houses in Ireland and all the social housing and all our state buildings will only have sheep wool, sheep's wool in them. Well, now you've scaled up. Now you've made some manufacturer eager beaver to, man to get that state contract. And from that, then. The price of the insulation for, you know, the ordinary person who's building a house will start to decrease because what's happened at the moment is that some of this sheep's wool insulation, it's actually out of the reach of your average person. So it's almost like a premium product for now. And I think the state could really come on board there by requesting that the SEAI and other agencies involved in protecting our environment um, started to look at biofiber and ensure that it's Irish grown biofiber not imported from austria um that goes into these products and then we've got scale then we've got a commercial entity and then we've got 
a really good chance at making it a um, an everyday thing in everyday life. Very interesting. Uh, Patrick Dorian has asked whether the Goway sheep is used as a dairy sheep. No, she's not, Patrick, but she has a beautiful yield of milk for two twins. I've milked a few of them myself when made the, the little um, lamb might be a bit poorly and you have to just feed them by a bottle. So you get the cholesterol and the cholesterol then, as any of the dairy farmers or um, any of the farmers would know, it's the first bit of milk that comes from the sheep and it's high in nutrients and it creates a load of... Um, strength within the little baby for fighting disease so it boosts their immune system so they she's a great milker but they don't use them as a dairy breed no um geraldine mcmahon has asked any advice on getting rid of rushes well would you believe it geraldine the ponies and the sheep ate mine this year now i don't have a lot of them uh but as i walk about i see that they're all clipped and I don't know, is that because they've lost the interest in the grass? But I do know that there are particular areas that where you can top the rushes, harvest them, and they're perfect for organic farmers for bedding. So it is actually a crop, believe it or not, in certain parts of the country and in certain parts of Europe, it's a very valued uh, bedding crop. So if you can get somebody to cut them and bale them for you, I'd say you might have no problem selling them to organic farmers for bedding. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eugene Hanley has asked, a lovely looking sheep, just wondering if a liver fluke can be an issue when out wintering. Uh, it could be, correct. And I worked for one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world that sold one of the most renowned products for liver fluke in the, wor in the world. And I don't dose them. No, no, no. So I know a lot about liver fluke and a lot about liver fluke dosing. Um, I haven't been out there 20 years ago on the ground selling the stuff. But I don't dose them. But what I would do is I would watch them constantly to see are they... Are, are they going what they call back in themselves? So I'd be monitoring them to see, you know, are they poorly? Um, I don't know if you can see her now, but she's actually, she's in great condition. She's only a two-year-old. She's expecting twins. But but you would be looking out for the signs of liver flu. So you'd be looking out for their condition. Um, but you're right. Right now, it's predominantly a really strong, uh, wet winter. And this is where liver flu could be very, very damaging. But uh, so far, we've been quite lucky that way. Great. Uh, Clara's asked, uh, with docks, was that a sign of overgrazing or compaction caused by some other way? Um, it's a sign of, for, for, for it. on this farm, it's a sign of compaction because, as I said, there was cars and there was trailers and there was ring feeders and there was, you name it, everything was left there. So, But the sheep actually eat the dock. And if you get a chance, we have an Instagram. It's called the Galway Wool Co-op. And it's at, the, at Instagram. Um, and there's a picture there recently taken of a lovely family in County Westmeath. And it was done by a professional photographer. And if you look closely, the sheep is actually grazing the dock. She's actually enjoying her dock. Um, so, yeah, so sheep, sheep will graze dock. But it's just an important part. I don't want to be too euphoric about it. There has to be a small supply of grass. They won't go out and eat the, gra the dock. They'll only eat it when, when they're not happy with the grass. And they love the grass and the clover that we have here. So they're not as good on the dock as they used to be. But we'll, we'll work on that. Brilliant. There's lots of questions coming in through and through, but I, I just to go back to um, just a couple of things I have here, um, Blotnid, and is there anywhere in particular you went to get support and advice? Well, my parents were brilliant. My parents brought me up with a hunger and, a, and an interest and a curiosity for farming. I did my ag, my master's, um, and my MSc in Ag Innovate and NUIG in 2020, and part of that was I did a lot of I did a lot of research on the wool and the Irish wool industry and the Irish woolen industry. And then I spent the latter half of it doing a lot of research on food, the origins of food, the interest in people on where food comes from. So I actually did my thesis on the provenance of the link between food, where it's grown and whether or not you have an interest in that as a farmer. Um, so I kind of, I suppose I've been self-taught. Where, where I'm at today, I've been self-taught. But don't forget, I was at one of the best bastions of education in Ireland. I went to the Ag College in Mount Bellew and I learned some wonderful things back there in the 1980s. So so I came with a bit of knowledge and um, my uncle was great too. I mean, he, he wasn't actually the type of guy you'd go out and learn too much about farming from. But he definitely, you know, he was great at showing you the signs of nature and being more observant about, you know, the, the life cycles and the growth patterns around you and, and the weather and what to expect from it. So... So PJ kind of put the crocodile Dundee into me and my parents um, exposed me quite a lot to hard work and tenacity. So I suppose 
I came with a bit of grounding. I came I came to the story with a bit of grounding, I suppose, and a bit of uh, a bit of an ability to work if I have to. Yeah, good girl. Um, and is there one memory that stands out for you on your farm that working alongside nature? Is there something that turned up on your farm or something that you saw that you went, geez, isn't I lucky to live where I am or to do what I do or whatever? That happens every day, Bridget. <laughs> every single day. I yeah. hate to do it, but it is just a joy to behold. Whether it's the winter, the summer, the autumn, there's something different on the farm every day. I have to say the sheep, uh, especially on a snowy day or a frosty day, um, watching the sheep, uh, they sleep. They sleep. They seem to have the same nocturnal patterns as we do. Um, if you happen to be up early, they're actually all out there and they're asleep. And if you get out for a walk and you just see them all just sleeping away, um, that's lovely. I, it's, you know, fr- you, when you walk out for your walk and the next thing, this, this hair takes out from underneath you and you get the shock of that. Um, I've seen a few foxes uh, during the day. Uh, coming up to lamb and that's not something that I'm thrilled about but touch wood they haven't taken any of us yet we have chickens and geese here on the farm and they haven't taken any of the chickens and the geese either um, we leave them alone they leave us alone um, so that's wonderful there's a lot of bird life here on the farm um, and then my biggest and um, brightest hope is that maybe this year I'll see one of the marsh fertility up in the butterfly sanctuary because I haven't seen her yet but I'm hoping fingers crossed I'm hoping this could be the year has she so you're you're setting up the the habitat for the marsh fritillary, but she she hasn't turned up yet or he, he hasn't turned she's up. She's there. Um the ranger from the national parks has been out and they were so impressed with the abundance of devil's bit sebaceous that we have in that particular area. Um that they want us to just we have a grazing process that we do with them. So we have to bring in ovines or equines at particular times of the year. Um we can't get the sheep up there, they're not allowed up, they know that. Um, but we work we work a grazing management system with the national parks so that we can encourage more of the devil's bit sebaceous. Um, but I haven't seen her. There are a lot of butterflies up there. I'm not au fait with all my butterfly species, but I've seen up to seven different types um, at this point in time. Um, so maybe that's something that I look forward to in the future, learning a little bit more about my butterflies. Brilliant. So on that, do you ever kind of think about the legacy you're leaving behind on your particular farm and how that influences how you farm? Every day, every day. And unfortunately, we didn't have family. We tried very hard. We were just a couple that were very unlucky. And that 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 part of life was very unfortunate for us. Um, and that breaks my heart every day. But there are lots of people out there that will have an interest. Look, my uncle, he didn't have, he didn't have kids. And he was very fortunate, I suppose, that... He had the whole parish was his family, you know, and all his nieces and nephews were his sons and daughters. Um, So, you know, what I suppose for me, the legacy that I want to leave is that part of what the work that I'm doing with with the Wool Co-op is that somebody's getting very comfortable there, is that that I did my best for heritage sheep, that I did everything I could to bring the fibre that created the Irish woolen industry, the iconic fibre that was used in the iron sweater that went all over the world and is internationally recognisable, that these that these girls and their antecedents who gave up their fleece and for the women who knit with this fleece and for the respect that they had for strong wool back then, I hope to think that, you know, I was part of the reason why they didn't become extinct and I was part of the reason why people have found a new found love in, in real bonding and that they want to work with strong wool again and... And we want to be proud of our strong wool and proud of the people, the innovators and the scientists that will come behind me and say, OK, she's made the supply chain clean again. She's made it readily available again. She's opened up partnerships with the likes of Donegal Yarn, who will spin the mill, spin the yarn. Um, so as innovators, we're going to look to see how we can make it, you know, pliable and suitable for all types of textiles and innovation that's out there. That's my legacy. That's that's the legacy that I dream about. Well, your ladies certainly look very comfortable around you anyway. Um, Clive Bright has said here, we all aspire to have some crocodile done DNS. So there you go. There's a, there's a bit of CD. Thanks, Clive. And by the way, Clive has been one of my inspirations. When I when I became a Farming for Nature ambassador, I, 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 I was overwhelmed. I was going down to the ambassadors and I was thinking of all the people that I have been stalking on Instagram and YouTube over the last few years, you know, especially around about the times when I couldn't get my hands into actually farming Per se, I was like, I was still at the janitorial stage and I was wondering about all these 
different things that I'd like to do. And Clive was one of those people that I was going, hero! You know, so <laughs> thanks, Clive. Um, they made me the camera shy now, actually. So that's really <laughs> fun. Yeah. The lady beside you isn't anyway. She's delighted to be part of it. Yeah. Come here, Blotnit. You've done a great job. Thank you so much for sharing us. And I know there's lots of comments here. People are just thrilled to have been listening to you tonight. And you've you've been really, really generous with your knowledge. And there's just a, a mountain of information there. So well done. Keep up the great work. And it's, you know, it's the first time I've ever done something like this where I actually have the farm on in situ. So it's really nice to do a, a live interview with them. And they're so calm that you've sold them to me anyway. Listen, oh, Jonathan, thanks great. very much. Thanks to everyone that's for joining. Great. Can I just say thanks to anybody who's come tonight? And I am a volunteer. I do do this um, out of the love of my heritage. So if anybody's out there and they can give us some support, we're at the go. We will co-op on Instagram. We have um, we have a, a Facebook page, but I don't know how to use it. And we also have a website. So if you come up with any bright ideas or, you know, anybody that's interested in buying 5,000 kilos of beautiful heritage Irish brown wool, don't be afraid to give me a ring. Just not after 10 o'clock at night. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. So if anyone uh, would like to listen to this or you feel would be interested in listening to this, we'll have the recording up, at, up on YouTube in the next 24 hours. Or if you miss part of it, you're um, able to kind of catch up on this or any other ones that we've had up on YouTube. We also, the second Tuesday of next month, we'll have uh, David Kerr speaking about his dairy farm. So do join us then. Meanwhile, thanks very much, Blotnet. Thanks to all the ladies in the background and, uh, and great job. And we'll chat to you all again oh. soon. <laughs> Bye.